Bodega part DHSS. DHS. Beautiful. DHS. Bodega part DHS. Sniper class, you will come to attention, barked the burly instructor. He had the self-assurance of a toddler, stood, hands on hips, on the brow of a low ridge at the firing range on Cavell 7. Ah, uh, 6, sorry. His clothes were so khaki coloured that they all I don't want to get my Cavell mixed up. His clothes were so khaki coloured that they almost acted as camouflage against the backdrop of the dull brown sky. His uniform fluttered in the strong wind that was battering them all. The windsock, a few meters behind him, was pulled completely horizontal, but it dipped suddenly as the breeze died for just a moment before spiraling vertically as a strong breeze ripped it upwards, then back to horizontal. The wind was nuts. As ordered, the 12 young recruits snapped to attention. The instructor descended the small ridge and began walking back and forth before them, inspecting them with menace. My name is Torque Murble, and the instructor here at the Kuvail Royal Stopper Academy. You have been selected by your local cadet school because you've shown aptitude beyond the norm. However, he said, turning sharply and wagging a finger at them, what your school considers aptitude is not what I consider aptitude. What you are right now is scrub stains. You couldn't hit the broad side of a herd of whoopals. You shoot worse than Berflanian shock surrender troops. This caught the attention of a young man named Bodega, who began daydreaming. I heard of those fellers, he thought. My daddy told him back on our Whoople Ranch. Whoople Ranch, huh? Ever hit the broad side of one? Snapped the instructor. Sir, I didn't say nothing, pleaded Bodega, mystified. Why don't you tell me all about Berflanian Shock Surrender Troops, since you know so much, if you will, Cadet Bodega? Well, sir, uh, stammered Bodega. Way I heard it, Berflanians got a whole mess of folks down on their world, and when it comes to fighting, they just try to overwhelm the enemy with numbers. The number of Berflanians all trying to surrender is what it is, sir. Would you bless us with your critique of this tactic, cadet? asked Talk Merble, squinting at the young man before him with mock interest. I think if them Berflanians just had some sack to them, they might be able to fight instead of acting like a bunch of Dildonians about it, sir. Fight, huh? I see, I see, young cadet Bodega here clearly understands warfare. Perhaps you can give us a demonstration of your abilities, young General Bodega, laughed Merble, grabbing Bodega by the collar and encouraging him with great vigor to make friends with the firing position on the ground next to them. Grab that standard issue Mark I Shrovian sniper weapon cadet, shouted Merble, so close to his ear that a tiny glob of spittle shot its way inside. Oh, uh, yes sir, yes sir, said Bodega slowly before calmly pressing the butt of the rifle into his shoulder and supporting it with his arms. Do you see that target at the far end of the range, cadet? Asked Merble, feigning concern. Sir, I can see it just fine, sir, said Bodega. The wind brought a tear to Bodega's eye, but he ignored it, and the tear rolled quickly across his forehead, leaving a cold trail in his skin. Chamber one round of standard issue Shrovian 10mm sniper heart caliber, if you please, said Merble. Bodega chambered the round. He looked at the target, which was barely visible at a distance of six kilometers. He began calming his breathing. Smooth breaths, in, out, in, out. Don't panic, don't snatch at the trigger, don't let Merble put you off. Think I'm gonna try and put you off, huh? Whispered Merble in his ear. I know you think you're hot flower boy. I've seen thousands of cadets in my time, and they all think <laughs> the same flower. thing. They think they'll shut me up by hitting that target, and I'll pin a medal on their chest and I'll retire on the spot. That's what they all think, Cadet Bodega. But ain't even one of them come close. And with that, Marble stood to his full height and grinned a real scrub-eating grin. Bodega fixed the old man with a hard stare. I'm thinking when I make this shot, you'll give me a pass and let me skip this class so I never have to see your face again, you florvin chaffel munger. There ain't nothing you could teach me, thought Bodega. Merble knelt down, his face only inches from Bodega's. It's a deal, said Merble, his voice almost lost on the wind. Bodega said nothing. He turned back to look down the rifle and its target. There was a reason the sniper school was on Cuvel. The huge planet revolved at a fantastic rate, with a day-night cycle only three hours long. As a result, it had extremely strong winds, and its Coriolis effect was off the charts. Add to that, it's stronger than normal gravity, and it was the worst possible conditions for a sniper. You'd do well to hit a target on Cuvel, the saying went. It was not a popular saying. Fire when ready, far <laughs> face, said Merble. Bodega stared down the scope of the rifle. It was grainy, old. The rifles they were using were ex-military for a reason. They'd seen a lot of use. The barrels were worn, the sights were worn, the triggers were temperamental. It don't matter none to me, old man, Bodega thought. I learned to shoot with a homemade rifle my daddy gave me anyhow. Using the scope, he looked for signs of which a ways the wind was blowing. 
Over six kilometers, the wind would be traveling every direction imaginable. The bullet he would fire would be struck from all sides by buffeting breezes, pulled downwards by gravity, and suffered crazy deviation from the Coriolis effect. He had to take it all into account when he pulled that trigger. Add to this the target itself. Six kilometers hence, high atop a dull gray post, a small metal plate had been affixed. It was circular, it was pristine, and it was only 10 centimeters in diameter. Ain't nobody ever hit the target, Cadet Bodega, said Merble, squatting beside him. Hope you got a spare, said Bodega. Behind him, the class laughed, so laughed softly. Go ahead, hotshot. Whenever you're ready to show us what the big mouth leads to, you just go ahead and yank that trigger, said Merble. Bodega took one more look. He sensed the path of the bullet. He visualized it striking the target and knocking it clean off its post. He felt for the trigger, took a deep breath, held it. Firing, said Bodega. He squeezed the trigger. No sooner had the observers felt the faint concussive shock of the weapon firing than, with a colossal crack, the barrel of the rifle split clean in two, and the entire weapon fell apart in Bodega's hands. Merp let out a huge whoop of laughter and began laughing so hard his face turned bright red. The rifles are dead, he screamed, before shrieking with laughter again. <laughs> Seven seconds later, his laughter was cut short by a distant metallic ping. All eyes turned to the target, which fell silently to the ground. Works fine, said Bodega, standing and extending his hand to Merble. Sir, I believe we had a deal, he said calmly. Merble, trembling with disbelief, reached out and shook Bodega's hand. You, you, you're excused, Cadet, Cadet Bodega, he mumbled. Bodega turned to his former classmates. Been a pleasure, boys. See you at Chow. And with that, he strode back towards the barracks, where, with the rest of his squad absent, he would spend his newly found free time masturbating furiously. The end. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Bravo. What a what a bodega. What a bodega. Oh, it's nice to have some from the uh, from the from the from the past.